Good morning and welcome to EP Live. We are so happy to be mm -hmm. here with you today. My name is Taylor. I'm here with my friend Kayla this Hi. morning. And we just want to give a big welcome to all of you who are here in person and a special welcome to all of you who are watching online, especially those who are watching for the first time today. If it's yes. your first time viewing a service here at East Point, we would love for you to go ahead and comment new in the comment section so that we can say hello to you this yeah. morning. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of saying hello, we have our online hosts ready for you this morning. So be sure to use our chat feature. Um, ask questions, say mm -hmm. hi, definitely let us know if you are brand new because we would love to just say hi and help you get connected um, in whatever ways that we can. Mm -hmm. And also, um, we have our prayer team available for you throughout the entire service. So if you have something that you would love to have prayed over, just go ahead and click that request prayer button and one of our um, hosts will chat with you this morning. And there's there's just something really cool about mm -hmm. being able to pray together and, and feeling that connection. So, um, yes. but we are actually in going into our second week of yeah, Restore. We are. What? That's crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. Um, I'm really excited for this series because we are studying the book of Matthew mm -hmm. and specifically we're studying Jesus himself mm -hmm. and what he did through his ministry. And, um, you know, when you start to think back of, of what Jesus did and mm -hmm. what he came to do for everyone, he changed everything yeah. and he, he flipped things around and he, um, he came to restore the broken. Mm -hmm. And that's so beautiful to me. And I, I love that, um, just that analogy that he is here to restore like yeah. that. It's so beautiful. Um, so in preparation for this week, I was looking at our study guide, which is available on our website. And I was going to look through the questions for this week, but on the first, I think it was the first page of the study guide, if I'm not mm. mistaken, um, there was a question that caught my eye. And the question is, Jesus is asking his disciples um, who have spent time with him. And he says, who do you say that I am? Mm. And that question just really stuck out to me. Like, who do I say that Jesus is for me? Um, it's kind of like a heavy question. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like thinking through that as you're yeah, saying that. It's, it's a wow. lot to process, but yeah. I would love to hear from you. Um, for those of you who are tuning in online, who do you say Jesus is? Because he is so many things. He is mm -hmm. all things and he's our redeemer. He restores us. He mm -hmm. gives us hope and yeah, so I would just love to hear from you guys this morning. Who do you say that Jesus is? Feel free to chat in the comments um, with That's us. That's a deep question. It's a deep question. <laughs> Surprise. We're starting off with a bang. <laughs> One of the first things that popped into my mind, just as you were saying that, mm. um, is friend. Mm. I, I think that there's such a friendship um, in uh, my relationship with Jesus and was reading through uh, Matthew this morning. I've been reading through that with my friend, Anna. Hi, Anna. Um, and was just reading through being a city on a hill and how um, we are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. And when we come together with others and really get to walk with one another and grow in our relationship with each other and grow in our relationship with Jesus, we shine that much brighter. Yeah. Um, and so as we do that, we get to find freedom and we get mm -hmm. to learn how to share our story. And that's what we're all about here at East Point. We're all about getting to know Jesus, finding freedom, engaging that community, and ultimately sharing our story. So if you want to do that, if you want to join a life group or a class and just walk with others, you can go ahead and head on over to our website and sign up for one of those. And we would just love to get you connected here. Yeah. For sure. For yeah. sure. We also have something really exciting. Our internship application um, timeframe has <gasps> opened. Yes. So we have quite a few opportunities for interning here at mm -hmm. East Point with us. And we love having our interns every year. There's just something so special and so unique about the people who come in and um, mm -hmm. we get to spend time with them and we get to learn from them just like they get to learn from us as a staff. And yeah. it's just really sweet. So um, if you're interested at all about learning about our internship programs, just go to eastpoint.church slash intern and you can find everything there. But we wanted to give you like a firsthand story from one yeah. of our current interns, Brooke. She is amazing. Mm -hmm. Her heart for Jesus and her heart for people shine through everything that she does. And I mm -hmm. love that about her. But we wanted you to take a look at her story today. And I am a con connections team intern this year. 
On the connections team, I get to work alongside Keenan and also learn from him. We've been developing ways to both um, connect more with our existing church family and also the new people that have come into the church, how we can get them more connected with groups, classes, and also their walk with Jesus. I was actually last year finishing off a degree that I had long been put off. The degree was in uh, theology, and I was like at the point of, uh, what now, God? And the internship came up, and I thought it was just a great opportunity to learn more about the inner workings of the church and to see where God might be leading me to potentially a career in ministry. It's just seeing the change, the and each of us interns, as we've grown together, from where we were back when we started last August to now, we've got a chance to just grow and learn so much, to see God move in each of our lives, and also to get to spend time with each of the staff members and learn their stories and their hearts for their ministries. I've just seen God move in incredible ways. He's just given me so much more confidence that spilled over into my nine to five job, that spilled over into my life group. It's um, just every aspect of my life. I've seen him, the ways that he's connected me with other people and I'm, the ways I've seen him move in their lives. It's just been incredible. The first thing I tell them is to pray. Just like say, you know, God, is this where you're leading me to go? And then I really say, go for it. I mean, you're never too old. That's the first thing I learned is you're not too old to do this. And you don't have to be in some school or some anything like that. It just if you have a call on your heart and you wanna learn more, I'd say go for it. It's just the most rewarding experience. If you ever have questions, you know, I'm, I'd love to talk to you about it because it's just been the most rewarding experience for me and I'm happy to share that. I just love Brooke. <laughs> She's and so sweet. What she said is so true. If you do have questions about anything, she would be a great person to yeah. talk to or any of the other interns. Um, but I just love getting to hear her heart um, yeah. surrounding this internship. And one thing that she said that really stuck out to me was that throughout the internship process, it really has built a lot of confidence for mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true. You get to be around other people who encourage you and... Um, kind of point out your different um, gifts and yeah. help uh, to build you up in the thing that you love. So mm -hmm. I would highly recommend doing the internship also because I did it myself and yeah. it was such a great experience. Um, so yeah, head on over to our website. You can sign up for that. Student Ministry is looking for an intern. Yes, would highly are. recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> You'd get to work with Taylor and Steve and Communications. Yes. Um, is also looking for an intern. So mm -hmm. we have so much fun just as a team. And there's just such a a unity amongst us. And so it's just really a fun environment. So yeah. um, really check it out. Even if you just might slightly be interested, just mm -hmm. check it out. We we highly encourage you to do that. It's, it's worth it, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've got a couple of people joining us online this morning. Wow. We've got yes. Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Thank you. She's tuning in from Madawaska. Wow. Where is that? Well, <laughs> is that north? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Moving on. <laughs> but thank you for tuning in from Madawaska. <laughs> and we have Zachary. Welcome, Zachary. We're so happy you're here this morning. And I see Gary as well. Um, good morning to you. And thank you so much for joining us, um, especially during this series and mm -hmm. going through Matthew together. Um, if you are just tuning in for the first time, like Kayla said, I would highly recommend downloading the study guide, yes. reading through Matthew, really just getting in there yourself mm -hmm. um, and then listening to the sermon series and, and talking with other people about it. But yeah, last week's message was it really was good. Really good. Yeah, really good. I'm going to go back and listen to it again because I missed half of it. <laughs> Well, Don't. that's Oops. the good thing is that it's online and you can yeah. go on over to our website to watch it. But I really enjoyed hearing about how, um, you know, life can be stormy and sometimes mm -hmm. we feel like we're in our own boat and we're alone and yep. the waves are crashing over and we don't really know what's up and what's down, but Jesus is there with us in yep. the middle of the storm. And yep. it's so true. And I've experienced that in my own life mm -hmm. and it's just been, um, yeah, it's been amazing and he's changed my life. So yeah. It's Highly stuff. recommend it. Thanks for joining us this morning. Let's work. Good morning and welcome to everyone who's 
here with us and everyone who's tuning in online. Psalm 118.24 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This morning, let's rejoice in the light of our Savior. Let's worship together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, oh online are in need of a miracle all right so today we're going to sing a new song it's called breathe miracles all throughout scripture we see that the breath of god brings life brings understanding so as you sing this out think that pray it with your heart let's go the name above the battle the undefeated Savior stands with me. The fighter for the weary. The Lamb of God, the Lion Hearted King.
Jesus. Breathe life into our lungs. Breathe life into our souls, Father. Come awaken us for you. Move our spirits for you, Father. Everything we do is for your glory. God, we ask that you would just come and break any strongholds that are around us. Break any fear, any anxiety, any sadness, any burdens, God. Just release us of that, Father. Come and overwhelm us. Fill our hearts with your love, with your goodness, God. We love you and we lift you up this morning. It's in your name we pray, amen.
come falling down. I've come to worship. I've come to worship. Don't be afraid to worship. There's a love that lives in me. For you, Lord, my Savior King. It breaks the sin that's bought. memory of church was actually at Holy Cross and I sat next to my cousin and the message that she heard was a God of caring, of grace, of mercy, of love and what I heard was you're going to hell and that followed me around for a very, very, very long time. I tried to comfort those, those negative feelings with relationships, with climbing the corporate ladder, with money, with addictions and, and just nothing seemed to work. It may have worked for a minute, but really just seeking all the, all the things that I didn't need to seek and that didn't work and, and the emotional and the, and, the, and the spiritual pain of all that was just way too much to handle. And I walked around with that stuff for a really long time. I got the chance to move back to Portland about two and a half years ago and really found myself surrounded with a bunch of people here at East Point and in, in some other fellowships that just uh, were happy, they were healthy, they were liking life and liking their life and liking other people and, and just having fun and, and that was all missing in my life. So I started coming to East Point more regularly and, and I started to, to really follow Jesus because my way just wasn't working. So the question of why I want to get baptized can be answered fairly easily. I've been following Jesus for a short period of time now as to the best of my ability on a really daily basis and it's just time to make the internal external just declare that uh, Jesus is Lord. My name is Paul Hayden and today I declare that Jesus is Lord.
Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Lift your praise to God. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. You are Lord. You are Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit in this place. Thank you for opening hearts today. Thank you for Paul declaring that you are Lord. Thank you for transforming his life, God. Would you use his story and him in mighty ways and gift him with gifts from your Holy Spirit. And everyone said, amen. Awesome worshiping. What words come to mind when you think of Jesus? Maybe it's compassionate or kind, healer, humble. Honestly, I could spend the rest of this service coming up with words about Jesus and still not scratch the surface. But one word that always stands out to me when thinking about Jesus is his generosity. And I don't mean in the sense that we typically think of it. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 2 verses 6 through 8 about Jesus' generosity. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now there's a fourfold act of humility that is demonstrated through Jesus' generosity. First, he was equal with God but that was something he didn't want to cling to. So he humbled himself by giving up his divine privileges. Second, he was born as a human, which is definitely a downgrade from being equal with God. Third, he humbled himself to the point of death. And fourth, he died the most humiliating death ever conceived of by human minds, which was the cross. Why? Because he had our eternal future in mind. He gave of himself and any security he had on earth so that our future beyond this earth would be secure with him and his heavenly father. When we give with eternity in mind, we are partnering with Jesus, allowing him to use what he has so graciously given us to further his kingdom on earth. Jesus gave up heaven so we could experience it. When we give, we give with that same motivation of seeing more and more people have the opportunity to experience the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom that will not see the decay of earth, but of the glorious future with Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you gave up heaven through your son, Jesus, so that we could experience life with you. We thank you for that radical generosity. And Father, would we be motivated out of a love for you to give back to you and be generous back to you so that more and more people can see you through this ministry. We thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in the lives of our church members and in the lives of the church in general. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 10 34, Jesus says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn. Nothing on earth can bring about the kind of newness that Jesus has to offer. Without him, our lives will remain in pieces. But Jesus came into this broken world to make us whole again. He came to do more than just fix. He came to nourish. He came to fill. He came to set a new table. He came to restore. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Well, good morning, church family. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Graham. 
I am the Young Adults Pastor here on our staff here at East Point. And if you're watching us online, thanks so much for uh, joining us this morning. Hey, can we give another praise to God for how awesome that worship time was? He's worthy, right? So great. Praise God. So much fun. So uh, this morning, I want to ask you kind of more of a, a sobering question. Has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like you were beyond the reach of help, where you felt hopeless or you felt broken. Um, I remember I sat across from a young adult last summer and he had tears in his eyes as he was describing an addiction that had formed in his high school years. And then in college, it, it had only gotten worse. And then it started to rear its ugly head up in his life as a young adult and was starting to really mess up his life. And I remember he was sitting across from me with tears in his eyes, and he said, I've tried so many times, time and time again, to quit this addiction, but nothing seems to be working. Maybe, maybe you can relate. Maybe there's been times in your life where, where you felt beyond the reach of help, where you felt hopeless, broken, in despair. Maybe there's someone here this morning, you've been wrestling with a medical diagnosis, and there's really no treatment for it, and, and you're just frustrated by that. Maybe some of you this morning, you're, you're struggling with mental health issues and mental health battles, and it seems like the same cycles keep repeating themselves over and over again, and, and you're just fatigued at this point. You're starting to lose hope. Maybe there, there's some, some people this morning where you're just have, having some relationship issues. You're, you're going from one broken relationship to the next, and you're thinking, I don't know, maybe, I, maybe I'm just cursed. Maybe I, maybe I need to give up on relationships altogether. Or maybe this morning you're watching us online and, and you're just looking for some hope that's just going to get you through today. Well, I just want to encourage you, keep watching because I really believe that you're going to have the hope that you need not only to get you through today, but for the rest of this week and a lifetime. Because today we're going to be continuing on in our series called Restore, where just like what we saw in that cool uh, bumper video, uh, that Jesus turns the tables on this broken and dying world, and he resets a new table of his kingdom. Pretty cool. And so today we're going to be looking at two individuals in the book of Matthew who are feeling out of reach of help in their own way. Uh, one was unable to walk. He has a physical disability. And the other one, although he's able to walk, probably wouldn't be able to walk to his workplace without being sneered at and spit on by his fellow community members. Two different people, two completely different circumstances, both in a need of a savior, both in need of restoration. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead, open up to Matthew chapter 9. That's where we're going to be today. If you don't have one, that's okay. We'll be putting up the scriptures on the screen. And we're going to be introduced here to our first individual who feels beyond reach. It says, Jesus stepped into a boat. He crossed over and came to his own town. When some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. So here we're introduced to our first broken man, right? And, and his problem is evident. He's paralyzed. And we don't know how he gets paralyzed. We, we're not sure if it was, uh, he was born this way. If in his youth he fell off a horse and, and got paralyzed, we don't, we don't know how, how it happens. But what we do know is that his problem, his, his paralyzation probably would have affected his life so drastically. That he would probably be watching his friends playing sports and wondering, what would it be like to, to jump in there and play along? That even in his day-to-day -day life, the, the simple things that we take for granted, he, he wouldn't be able to do on his own, maybe get dressed or, or go to the store. And so I wonder at this point if he's just kind of given into the fact that this is how life is going to be for me. This is how life's going to be for me, beyond reach. And so I just imagine how he feels as his friends come to him and say, hey, have you heard? Jesus is in town. This is the Jesus that healed the lepers that cast out the demons from people. It's even rumored that this is the Jesus who calmed the storms. And so if I'm the paralyzed man at this point, I'm thinking, oh, man, that's exciting. 
I want to go see this Jesus guy. But at the same time, maybe it's just me and the doubter in me, but I'm wondering, if I'm the paralyzed man, can Jesus really heal me? After all this time, can, re- can Jesus really heal me? Maybe, maybe you're wondering that yourself. You see cool baptisms like Paul's baptism today. Can we give Paul a hand? That was awesome. That was so great. You see a transformation story like that, and you're wondering, can that happen for me? Maybe you're thinking, my past is is too bad, or, or I have areas in my life that are just too dark. Can Jesus really transform me? Well, I think we're going to get the answer in the text here. So the, the men, they bring their paralyzed friend on a mat to Jesus. And for whatever reason, Matthew leaves out some details that Mark and Luke fill in. And it seems that in the stories of Mark and Luke in this account, that Jesus is teaching in a house and it's so filled and crowded with people. There's people streaming out the door, maybe people sitting in the windowsills that the men can't bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. And so one of them has this great idea. Well, what if we go on the roof and dig through the roof and then we can lower him down to Jesus? Sounds like a, a group of men to me. So... <laughs> Here they are, they're digging through the roof, desperately trying to get their friend to Jesus. Mud, dirt, probably falling down. People are probably wondering, what is going on? And they're lowering this paralyzed man down to Jesus. And if I'm the paralyzed man being lowered down, I'm thinking, wow, this better at work, or else this is going to be really awkward, right? This is quite an entrance. And I think it's just so interesting what Jesus says here, this interaction that Jesus has with them. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, two things really stand out to me here. The first is that it says, when Jesus saw their faith. And and this is kind of unusual because usually Jesus is commending the faith of the person with the issue who comes straight to him. Think of the woman who is bleeding that touches Jesus' cloak. He commends her faith. But here, Jesus is commending the faith of the friends, of the ones who are lowering this paralyzed man down to Jesus, of these people who are desperately trying to get this person to Jesus. You know, as I read this, I'm inspired. I'm thinking, the world needs more faithful friends. The world could use more faithful friends who are just desperate to get the people in their life in the presence of Jesus. Amen? Yeah, the world needs more faithful friends. But the thing about it is, I don't know about you, but it's sometimes hard to be a faithful friend because usually being a faithful friend means that you kind of have to be annoying at times. (laughs) You have to embrace those awkward moments knowing, I think you're going to thank me for this later. Uh, I remember in high school, I had this uh, group of guys. We had this group that met at our house. It was a Bible study. It was called D Group. And uh, we had a blast together. And on Sunday mornings, we would carpool to church in the morning. And uh, we would be texting our friends, and are you ready? We're going to be there in five. And there'd be once in a while those mornings where our friend would just not be responding to our text. And so we'd be outside maybe honking the horn, like, what's going on? And so instead of just driving off, we, and you have to keep in mind, this isn't a prescription. We had a good relationship with each other. We'd go into their house, open up the blinds, maybe peer their eyelids open and say, come on, man. Put a hat on. You're going to church. We'll get you dunks on the way. That's annoying, right? That's a little awkward. But the reality is, I can tell you, we're all thankful for each other that we had faithful friends who are willing to bring us before Jesus. I want to ask you this morning, who do you need to be a faithful friend to right now? Who is God putting on your heart that you need to be a faithful friend to, to get in the presence of Jesus. Maybe God's putting someone on your heart this morning that's just texting someone who's been not around the past year because of COVID. Maybe it's someone in your life that you feel like you need to sit down with them. You guys know each other well, 
but it's time to, to share your, your story. It's time to talk about your faith. It's time to embrace a, a little bit of awkwardness and, and bring up Jesus. Who do you need to, to bring before Jesus? Because I'll tell you what, being a faithful friend, sometimes it's annoying, but you're thankful for them in hindsight. And, and, and that's what we see. It says that the men lower their friend down to Jesus, and Jesus says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, honestly, that's not what I expected Jesus to say here. <laughs> if I'm one of his friends, I might be like, <coughs> paralyzed, <coughs> you know, like, Jesus, <laughs> can't you see? He can't stand. Um, but Jesus knows the man's condition. He knows what's going on here. But Jesus knows that if he heals this man externally, if he gets him up walking, which he has the power to do, but if, and he doesn't address his soul, if he doesn't address his internal state, then he'll have him out the door walking, but his eternal resting point will not be with God. See, Jesus wants to heal him internally. He wants to address his soul. He wants to address his internal condition before he heals him externally. Jesus' priorities are eternal first. And so Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. And I imagine at this point, maybe the, the paralyzed man, he has tears streaming down his face. face. Maybe his, uh, he just feels a weight lifted off of him with these words that he wasn't expecting. And Jesus, he's, he's making a bold claim when he says this here because really God has the authority to heal sin, uh, to forgive sins. God only is the one who could forgive sins. And so he's kind of showing his cards to the people around him that he has the authority, that he is God in flesh. And so I imagine while some of the people are like, whoa, that's awesome. It seems that there's some people that are equally, equally as upset by these words. It says, at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to man. What an amazing scene, right? Here he is, paralyzed to walking. And I imagine maybe the paralyzed man, as he's carrying his mat, maybe does like a little heel click on the way out, passing the, the Pharisees, like, yeah, take that. <laughs> and it's such an amazing scene where Jesus is reaching down to this man who thought he was out of reach, showing him you're not out of reach when you're in the presence of Jesus. A beautiful moment. And so he's out the door walking, and the only ones who can't stomach it is these teachers, these Pharisees, because they, they're seeing this man who's saying that he's God in flesh, and that Jesus is saying, I haven't come just to fix broken legs. I've come to win hearts. I've come to save souls. I've come to take the sin of the world. I've come to show everybody that no one is beyond reach. So we have our first man down. Our second one is going to see the same thing. But his problem, he's not physically disabled. He's not physically beyond reach. He's socially beyond reach. Let's keep going on in the, in the text together. It says in verse 9, As Jesus went on for the, from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. So here's our second guy, Matthew. And turns out this is the guy who actually writes the book we're reading, Matthew. Pretty cool. And he's a tax collector. Now, just by the name alone, you know that his public rapport is probably not <laughs> very good. He's a tax collector. He imposes the taxes on the people. But on top of that, just a little context, 
the Jews at this time were under the Roman occupation. And so in order for Matthew to be a tax collector, he would have had to betray his own people to work for the Romans and impose taxes for the Romans on his own people. And so it's fair to say that Matthew was despised and hated by his people, that he was known as a traitor by his own people. And not only that, but it was, it was known that tax collectors would oftentimes, they would overcharge the person that they were imposing their taxes on, and they would give what's due to the Romans, and they would pocket the rest for themselves. And so here's Matthew, probably walking down the streets, called names, sneered at, spit on by his own people. And as I read this, I wonder, what did it take for Matthew to get into this occupation, right? Like, why did he become a traitor of his own people? I, I wonder, at this point, does Matthew even regret becoming a tax collector? Does he regret it? But at this point, I'm sure even if he, he does regret his decisions, he, he feels boxed into this new identity that he has. Who knows, maybe he needed the money. Maybe he already felt rejected by his people. He thought, well, what do I have to lose? But at this point, it's Matthew's identity. And he's boxed in to his decisions of his past. And it's now his identity. Maybe some of you, you can relate to being boxed in by your past. It's your identity. Maybe there's some of you here, you're living with a spouse that you're not married to, and when you started, you just thought, oh, we'd save money, we're in love, we're going to get married anyway, and now months have passed by, and you're still not married to one another, and you're thinking, oh, it's too awkward to address now. You feel boxed in by the decisions of your past. Maybe there's some people here that you're in a job that honestly you could care less about, but hey, I went to school for it, and so you're in this job now, and you don't have any passions for it, and you feel boxed in by the decisions of your past. You, you just stay because it pays the bills and there's security. It's funny how our past decisions can so easily box us in to an identity that we now have. But the cool thing about Jesus is Jesus doesn't define you by your past. He doesn't box you into your past. Instead, he calls you into a new future. He identifies you by your future, by a new calling in him. And so that's exactly what we see here with Matthew is he calls him out of his old past of his old identity into a new identity in Jesus, and he does it with two words. The text says, follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Man, I love that. It's like zero hesitation. It's almost like Matthew was waiting for him to, to say these words, follow me. He gets up, and in two words, he destroys the box of Matthew's past identity, and, Jesus, and, and Matthew steps into a new future with Jesus. Pretty cool, right? I want to encourage you today that Jesus is not defining you by your past. He doesn't box you in to your past. In fact, Jesus smashes boxes. <laughs> he smashes the boxes of your past. And that's why I love my job, is because here I get to watch Jesus break the box of addiction. He breaks the box of worthless. He breaks the box of promiscuity and lust. He breaks the, the box of workaholic. He even breaks the box of beyond reach. It's so fun to watch. Jesus smashes boxes in our old identities because he calls us into a new identity in him. Amen. I want to encourage you, Jesus can smash that old box you've been living in this morning with two words. All he has to say is, follow me. And I wonder how many of you this morning, you're needing to hear that this morning, that Jesus 
is saying, follow me to you. And maybe you're thinking, I'm scared. I don't know what that means. Follow me. What does that look like? Well, Jesus will show you. But when you step out of your old self and into a new future, Jesus will completely change your identity. You no longer have to be defined by your past, no matter how bad or dirty or wrong you think it is. It's exactly what he does for Matthew. And I almost picture maybe Matthew just flips that tax collector's booth, kind of like what we see in the bumper. The text actually doesn't say that. But I thought that would be pretty cool if he just flips that booth and follows Jesus. And so later on that night, what we see is that there's a party. There's parties in the Bible. Yeah, so (laughs) there's a party at Matthew's house that Matthew has Jesus and all the disciples at his house. Because how do you celebrate new beginnings? You throw a party. And so verse 10, it says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So here are these guys again, and maybe at this point you're thinking, what is with these Pharisees? Seems like they're following Jesus around everywhere he goes, trying to catch him in in some kind of dirt, like they're detectives following him around, and they finally find something. Here's Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And it's kind of cool to think that here the text says many tax collectors. So it seems like Matthew's already putting his network to work, right? (laughs) Here are all these tax collectors at his house that God is using him and his past to reach people that only he could reach because of his former occupation. So here are all these tax collectors hanging out and Matthew's being a faithful friend, having them over his house with Jesus. But I picture the music just kind of stops, and the Pharisees come in, and they ask this question, what are you doing, Jesus, hanging out with these people? Don't you see they're the problem? And maybe we would think the same thing if, if it was in our context that Jesus was hanging out with some prostitutes or some, a biker gang with, you know, tats on their neck or uh, some crooked politicians. You'd be thinking, Jesus, what, what are you doing hanging out with with those people. Don't you see that they're the problem? But Jesus' response is, is so genius here. Let's keep going. It says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. See, Jesus is really hitting it home for the Pharisees at this point. He's saying, hey, you see those people who you think are beyond reach, who you don't think are worthy? Well, guess what? Those are the people that I'm called here for. And the reason why the Pharisees can't see Jesus for who he is, they can't see him as a savior, is because they think they're good. They think that they're earning God's goodness, that they're earning their way into God's favor. They think they're, they think they're fine the way they are. And they think that those guys, they're, they're the problem. But Jesus is saying, those are the people that I'm called to love. Those are the people that I've come for. And that's why Matthew and, and the paralyzed man, they have something in common. They both know they're sick in need of a doctor. They both know that they're sinners in need of a savior. And so today, maybe maybe you felt beyond reach in one way or another. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus, even now, and you feel beyond reach, like you have a part of your, your life that's being tucked away that you don't think that Jesus can heal or restore. Or maybe there's some people here, you don't even know Jesus at all. But you're thinking, Graham, if you knew my past, if you knew the things that I got into, (laughs) Jesus doesn't want me on his team. Just put it that way. But here's the deal. You are exactly the person that Jesus came for. 
If you think that you're beyond reach, you are exactly the person that Jesus has come for. And so I want to encourage you today, if you have a repentant heart and, and you want Jesus to be your Savior, or if you just want to renew your relationship with him, I think that he would say three things, and he says these things in the text. He says it to the paralyzed man and to Matthew. I think he would say to you this morning, I think he'd say, your sins are forgiven. I took those on the cross. When I died the death you deserved, get up. <laughs> get up out of that lifestyle you're living. Get up out of that, that muck and grime. And I think he would say, follow me. You don't need to be identified by your past anymore. You don't need to be boxed in anymore. You can follow Jesus into a new future. And that's what it's all about, forming a new identity in Jesus. I think he would say, get up. No, nope. <laughs> your sins are forgiven. Get up and follow me. So maybe you're thinking, what does that look like practically for me this morning? Well, I think there are, t there are two practical things this morning that you can do if you just want to take a step closer to Jesus this morning. There's going to be a prayer team under the screens on my right and on my left, and they would love to just pray for you for whatever you have. Whether it's a health issue, an emotional issue, a spiritual issue, they would love to just pray for you. Uh, if you need to be socially distanced and prayed over, that's fine too, but we want to pray for you this morning. And maybe this morning you're thinking, I want to follow Jesus. I want to break the box of my past. I want to step into a new life with Jesus. Then we can do that through baptism this morning, just like what you saw with Paul who got baptized this morning. So awesome. We can do that for you too. We have towels, shorts, shirts, changing rooms in the back. We would love to help you see what it means to die to your old self and be raised to a new life in Jesus. Because here's the deal. In Jesus, we were all beyond reach because we're all sinners. Romans 3 says, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus lived a perfect life he came down to earth. He died on the cross for you and for me. And he rose three days later to show us that no one is beyond his reach. And so I want to encourage you this morning. You are not beyond reach this morning. We're going to take communion together. You can pull that out. But I'm going to pray, and then we'll go into our time of communion. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness that we're not beyond reach in you, Jesus. God, we love you so much, and thank you for bringing everyone here, and whoever's watching this online as well, thank you for them. God, we all have parts of our life that we like to tuck away. We all have, even us, us Christians who should know better, we all limit ourselves and put ourselves in boxes that we know we shouldn't. So Jesus, today we ask that you'd break those boxes, that you'd shine a light in those places of our life that, that are hidden and and gross and that we want to keep away from you and we experience the freedom and wholeness of reaching out our hand and following you jesus we love you it's in your name i pray amen all right so we're going to go into a time of communion here and in communion we remember jesus and we remember that he came down and and died the death that we deserved on the cross and took the sin of the world on himself and showed us that we're not beyond reach. And so together, let's, let's take the bread representing Jesus' body broken for us on the cross. Take and eat. Like, likewise, we'll, we'll take the, the juice representing Jesus' blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. We're going to pray, and then after I pray, we're going to continue worshiping. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for your death on that cross, for dying the death that we deserved. And because of that now, God, that we get to live in resurrection power, that we get to follow you, Jesus, that we get to receive the Holy Spirit. 
God, I pray that you would touch the people this morning who need to be touched this morning. God, that you would have a divine encounter for them. God, show them that you know every hair on their head. You know the days set before them, God, that you love them, that you want to call them out of the the places they've been and into a new identity in you, Jesus. So, God, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would just wash over us this morning. Remind us of your love, God. Remind us that, that, that there's hope in you, Jesus, that we can have a fresh and new life in you, that we don't have to be defined by our past, by our brokenness, but we can step up, we can have our sins forgiven, and we can follow you, Jesus, into a new life, into an adventurous life, into a new identity. And so, God, I pray that you would press on the hearts of the people this morning who need to take a step forward, whether it's just to be prayed over or accept you, Jesus, into their life. God, we love you, we praise you, and everybody said, Amen. All right, let's stand up and continue worshiping together.
Praise God. Praise God. Well, I just want to close out by sharing the story I started with. And uh, that same young adult who had despair in his eyes uh, said, I tried time and time again to quit this addiction. And I asked him the question. I said, well, have you ever brought Jesus into this situation? And he said, well, honestly, no. And I said, well, I think this time's going to be different. And praise God, he's still sober to this day. And he gave his, yeah. And he gave his life to Jesus in baptism that fall. And it's just such a cool thing to watch Jesus break the boxes of people's past who think they're beyond reach. And Jesus says, no, no, no. No one's beyond reach around me. I'll break that box and I'll show you a completely new life, a completely new way of living. And I believe he can do that for you this morning. So like I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll have prayer teams under the screens on my right and my left here. And then also, uh, if, if you felt like Jesus is calling you to say, to follow him, uh, you, can, you can get baptized as well this morning. We'd love to, to do that with you. Uh, we have shorts, t-shirts, towels in the back. We'd love to, to make that happen. So guys, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you next week.